Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for the latest episode of our Gleeble webinar series. My name is Daniel Quigley. I'm the Director of Business Development and Marketing here at DSI. I hope you, your families and colleagues are all staying safe and healthy. Today's presentation by Dr. Brian Allen will include a review of strip annealing capabilities and simulations that are possible in the Gleeble and how these can be used to speed production development optimize chemistry, minimize scrap and secondary, improve scheduling, and even develop processing to salvage off chemistry or misprocessed coils. As always, our goal will be to keep this webinar to one hour or less. If time allows, we will have Q&A at the end of the presentation. If you have questions, please submit them using the chat feature here in the webinar. As usual, we will have some of our staff here to answer questions directly in the chat during the presentation or we may be able to address some of those questions during the Q&A portion of the meeting if time allows. We have about 265 people registered to attend today, so we won't get to every question. However, we will do our best and we'll follow up after the webinar if needed. Video of this presentation will be, a, will be available online soon. Uh, in about two hours after the, the webinar concludes, you'll get an email with some links. Uh, you'll also be able to find a link to this video as well as videos of past webinars by going to our website, that's gleeble.com, and click on the resources link in the top navigation bar, and then click on webinars from the drop down menu. There you can view past webinars and sign up for future webinars. And I do encourage you to do that. We'll have uh, some very good guest presenters over the next couple of weeks. Next Thursday's webinar will be presented by Dr. Carl Slater from the University of Warwick. He will present case studies and share some best practices. The following week will feature Dr. John Lippold, Professor Emeritus from The Ohio State University. Dr. Lippold will present using the Gleeble to study cracking and welds. And again, I encourage you to register for these two great presentations, uh, gleeble.com, and then uh, as I mentioned, resources, and then webinars from the drop-down menu. Now I'd like to introduce Brian Allen. Brian is DSI's chief metallurgist. Many of you have likely met Brian at conferences or our facility or your facility or on a conference call at some point. Uh, if you've been listening to these webinars, you'll definitely recognize his voice. Uh, he's becoming quite famous from this webinar series. Uh, so Brian, I will hand this over to you. Thank you for preparing this presentation. And I think you have control now. Okay, good morning. Thank you, Dan. I'll just like to check very briefly if uh, make sure you're seeing uh, the first page of the presentation and hearing me okay. You sound great and I can see the presentation. Fantastic. I'm going to assume that's true for everyone. So again, as uh, as Dan mentioned, thank you all for attending this webinar. We do understand that you're all very busy. You all have a lot of very important tasks to do. So we do understand and value the time that you've chosen to spend with us. So uh, I will be discussing continuous strip annealing capabilities in the Gleeble. And I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about the agenda here. So uh, very briefly, I'll start off by discussing what is physical simulation. I'm, I think most people on this call probably understand that as well, but I do think it's worth spending uh, just a few seconds on. Uh, <clears throat> then I'm going to actually not jump into Gleeble applications immediately, but I'm going to do a slight review of the steel making in the continuous annealing processes as they are typically industrially practiced. Now, obviously there's a wide variety of different uh, companies out there that do this process. There are many different uh, designs and uh, layouts of lines. So this will be very general, certainly not intended to uh, to suggest that there is, uh, is, is only one way that continuous annealing is done industrially. But there are some points there that, that I think are important to bring up uh, for our later discussion in regarding the the things like heat lots, uh, chemistries, uh, transitions in the steel making process that do work their way downstream to have applications in the continuous anneal process that we will be trying to simulate. Uh, I'll then, based on that information, talk about the problem statement and what we at DSI are, are trying to solve by offering these continuous annealing simulations. Uh, then we'll spend some time talking about the benefits of continuous annealing simulations, and then we will go through some of the product offerings that DSI has uh, to allow you to do these continuous annealing simulations in the laboratory. So first of all, what is physical simulation? So at DSI, we don't consider ourselves a company that makes test equipment. We consider ourselves a company that makes physical simulation 
equipment. And that may be a little bit of a, of a, of a narrow difference there, but essentially what we are trying to do is produce equipment that can, in the laboratory, repeat exactly the thermal and the mechanical history that a piece of material will undergo either in production, uh, in manufacturing, or in final use of the product. The whole idea behind physical simulation at DSI is that one cubic millimeter of material doesn't know if it's in a strip going through a rolling mill, through a continuous annealing line, or if it's in a glebal. So if we can replicate precisely the thermal profiles, the strain profiles uh, of whatever process we're trying to simulate, we can do that in the laboratory, and we can do that much faster, much more cheaply, and with much less risk to production equipment uh, as opposed to doing plant trials. Additionally, your plant can continue running profitably while these trials are being done in the laboratory, whereas if you were to do these trials uh, actually in the plant, you'd have to take that plant offline for production material to run your trial material. So it's a productivity gain as well to be able to do physical simulation. Uh, very, very brief slide and just a, a, an overview uh, taken from the literature about the steel making process. As we all know, there are a couple different processes that are in general use right now to, to make steel. Uh, one is the oxygen steel making, sort of the traditional process where uh, iron ore, coke, and coal are fed into a blast furnace. Uh, iron ore is reduced to the basic iron. Uh, molten iron or pig iron is fed into a basic oxygen furnace which is uh, used to refine the steel. That goes to a uh, potentially a degasser if you're trying to lower the carbon. Uh, from the electric steel making side, you have scrap and or other iron units like direct reduced iron or hot briquetted iron that are melted in an electric arc furnace. And that goes to a ladle furnace, ladle metallurgy furnace uh, where the alloys are added. Now, the point I really want to make here is that this ladle metallurgy furnace will have a significant capacity, and there are various sizes, but it could be, you know, 50 tons, 100 tons, 150 tons. I really don't know exactly what everyone's capacity is, but the point is that when we're dealing downstream with the continuous annealing line, uh, I have more than one coil. So I have probably six or seven coils of this alloy chemistry that I have to melt based on the capacity of my little metallurgy furnace. So I'm dealing with large amounts of material. Now, why that's important, and I'll get into this a little bit more later, but uh, but I'll mention it briefly here, is that I can't just run one single coil of a chemistry and sell that coil. I have to understand that I have probably six or seven coils of any particular chemistry in line in my process as I'm going through and, and making those orders for my customers. Depending on if my customers have ordered six coils, that may be perfect because I can run them all. But if my customer has only ordered one coil of a particular product and I have to melt six coils, that leaves me with five extra or orphan coils that I have to figure out what to do with. And a big part of what I'm going to propose is the benefit of doing strip annealing simulations in the Glebal is that it gives me an opportunity to figure out the processing to process those extra five or six excess coils uh, into a sellable product on a prime order or a high value secondary order. Uh, again, this may probably be redundant for many of the people on this webinar, but I just thought it would be useful to go over a very, very brief basic schematic schematic of a strip annealing furnace. So typically the coils come in, they're run through a cleaning section. Uh, these are full hard coils. They've been through a, a reducing mill. So, so they're full hard coils coming off a cold mill. They're run through a cleaning section and then run through a heating, a soaking section, a cooling section, and then potentially a, an overaging or a temporary section before they come out uh, the end and are, are recoiled. The point I really wanna make here Actually, there are two points I want to make here. One is that this is a continuous process. So these coils have to be welded head of one tail, head of one coil to the tail of another tail as they're fed through this furnace. The other point that I want to make is that this furnace is a very large piece of equipment. And I'll show a couple of schematics later that uh, illustrate how big these are. So there could be hundreds or even thousands of feet of material in this furnace. This is obviously a massive furnace. It is not going to be adjustable uh, with regards to temperature in you know a few seconds or even a, a few minutes. So what that means is that I have limited ability to 
run single coil orders and I have limited ability to, to quickly change the furnace to match exactly the process that, that I might want to have. So the implications of that are that I do have to understand uh, what the entire process window, the entire annealing process window is because I may not be able to hit the exact temperature that I want to hit uh, in my process to get the product that I want. So I have to understand what that window is. If I can melt and uh, process a single grade, if I have a window of 50 degrees that I can uh, meet the properties with, or if I only have a window of 10 degrees, and then that allows me to schedule those coils properly. This is a very simple schematic of a hot dip galvanizing line. Uh, the previous schematic was a, a continuous annealing line, so it did not have a zinc pot. It was not created to coat steels, although most continuous annealing lines are part of a hot dip galvanizing line where we will, uh, we will heat the steel, uh, anneal the steel, and then coat the steel as well, all in the same line. Uh, really, it doesn't have any implications to the continuous annealing section of that line, but it does mean I have now even more strip in the furnace, and I may have a potentially a, a little different uh, air cooling zone, and if I'm doing a galvanil material, I'll have a, a secondary heating process after the zinc bath, which can also be replicated in, in the Glebel. So I mentioned a little bit earlier of, of, of really how big a beast that a continuous annealing line is. This is uh, simply a picture that I borrowed from the Dinelli website. Uh, certainly not trying to plug Dinelli here, but you can see the railings and the manways here. So this gives you an understanding of, of, of how big this really is. And as we saw in the previous slide, we have several loops of strip inside this furnace. So there is a lot of material in this furnace, which is really the takeaway point from this. And that I can't, you know, obviously a furnace of this size, I can't just change the temperature, you know, on a dime. It takes many, many minutes to, to swing the temperature of this furnace. And obviously as I'm changing the temperature of this furnace, I still have strip in the furnace because again, it's a continuous process. I can't stop this, uh, this furnace. So I have to understand what that, temperature change that I'm trying to do in my furnace as I change from one grade to another, what effect that will have on the product that is in the furnace. So having done that background, I'm also going to spend a minute or two here talking about really why, at least why I think this is important industrially. Uh, as we talk about continuously annealed steels, uh, they're used in many products, but the primary use of continuously annealed steels, particularly coated continuous continuously annealed steels is in the automotive industry. And obviously, although not all of them are, are going to automotive, uh, the automotive industry is really the driving market for most of these steels. Uh, as you probably all understand, the, the market there has changed quite a bit in automotive steels. So uh, as people are looking at better fuel economy for both environmental and economic reasons, the auto industry is, is very focused on weight. So the way they take weight out of a car, but still meet the higher safety requirements that are required is they use higher strength steels, but then they down gauge those higher strength steels. So they may replace uh, you know, a, a 210 MPA strength steel with a 420 MPA strength steel, and that allows them to reduce the amount of steel they need to make the, the final strength requirements. Uh, but the other thing you remember is you also have crash energy absorption requirements in the auto industry because that steel with the thinner gauge also still has to absorb enough energy to protect the occupants of that vehicle in a crash. So it's a, it's a very difficult balancing act between strengthening and down gauging and uh, crash energy management. So uh, as the alloys that are used in the automotive industry get more and more complex, uh, simple alloying is not enough. Uh, I'll have a couple slides here in a minute that shows that uh, you know just, just low carbon steels, uh, HSLA steels are, are no longer sufficient for the automotive industry, and they're moving into much, much higher strength steels, trip steels, transformation induced plasticity, twip steels, twinning induced plasticity, martensitic steels, uh, different types of trip steels, uh, quench and partition steels. The takeaway here is that these steels are much more complicated. They have much more complicated processing windows. The process windows are much tighter. And additionally, the, the alloys are a lot more expensive. So again, those plant trials, uh, those uh, 
mess ups, those uh, secondary coils that you can't sell on prime orders all become much more economically important. This is a material from the uh, World Auto Steel Foundation, and it just shows this, uh, this trend that I've been talking about. So in 2000, it shows that as far as what they consider advanced high strength steels, there was, there was very little advanced high strength steels in the automobile. So uh, here they're not referring to Bay Cardening, IF, uh, or HSLA as, as advanced steels. So the only advanced steels really in 2000 in, in common use in, in automotive were, were some press hardened martensite steels. And now you see the uh, the 2000 numbers. So obviously the, the amount of these more difficult to process steels is increasing dramatically. And obviously in order for that to happen, the the steel industry has had to come up with these process routings, develop these steels, and we are obviously still in the process of optimizing and developing new steels every day. So this is a very big trend in the automotive industry. It's a continuous and ongoing trend. This chart just shows the standard, what is often referred to as the banana curve. So this is simply illustrated to show that in this lower arc here, the trend as you go to higher strength is that you lose formability. So we can go from IF steel, which is very low strength, but very high formability, mild steel, carbon manganese, and HSLA steels. And as we gain tensile strength, as we gain uh, strength in the steel, we lose formability. Formability is very important for two reasons in the automotive industry. One, you simply have to make the part. So if I have a steel like a Martin Siddick steel here that has less than 10% total elongation, I'm probably going to barely even be able to bend that part without it fracturing. So to make things like frame rails will be very difficult. To make something like a, you know, a, a shock absorber tower or something that's a more complex part is going to be absolutely impossible. So we want to move away from this lower arc into these more advanced high strength steels where we have a better trade-off between strength and ductility. Uh, essentially, we want to try to get out of the traditional trade-off between strength and ductility, develop grades of steel that can give us both better strength and better ductility simultaneously. Uh, clearly, that's uh, kind of going against the, the nature of the physics of the material, so there's a lot of uh, more difficult processing, processing that's required in order to make that happen. I think this is the the final slide that I'll talk about just uh, just trends in steel, and this is a slide from again World Auto Steel, and this is the future steel vehicle, battery electric vehicle body in white structure. So this is uh, this is not a real car. This is something that uh, World Auto Steel has come up with as a a potential next generation battery electric vehicle, and you can see that almost all of the body in white of this material is high strength steels with only a very little bit of mild steel that is used in the body of white. So simply uh, meant to show how dynamic, how rapidly changing this market is and how fast the auto industry is, is demanding these advanced steels from the steel industry. Uh, and obviously the steel industry is going to have to do a lot of R&D to, to keep up with that demand. So we've talked about some of these points before, but as you're operating a continuous anneal line, there are a couple things that uh, that you have to keep in mind. And one, that this is a continuous process and coils are welded head to tail. So it's not a batch process. I can't just change my furnace settings from coil to coil. That means that I have to understand those process windows that I have. So when I'm transitioning from one grade of steel to another grade of steel, uh, I essentially have to figure out a temperature in that furnace that will work to produce the right properties in both of those coils because they will both be in the furnace at the same time. The tail of one coil will be in the furnace at the same time the head of another coil will be in the furnace and maybe as much as a half a coil or more in the furnace at any one time. So that means that I have to understand how to adjust my furnace in order to make those transitions. Now, the typical way that this is done, if they, the transitions are not well understood, if those process windows are not, are not fully defined, uh, I will have to put in what is called a warmer coil. So essentially, I have to put a secondary coil between my two prime coils. And while I have that secondary coil in the furnace, I will take that time to adjust the temperature of the furnace. Uh, it's a it's a good process. It works, but what that leaves me with is a 
a adjustment coil, a secondary coil that I was used to swing the furnace that now has different properties on the head and on the tail. And that coil is frankly just going to have to be sold as secondary or scrapped. So that's a very expensive process. And if we can use strip annealing simulation to understand the process windows of both those coils, it is possible that we can determine a line speed and line temperature that will allow us to meet properties on both those coils and eliminate that secondary, that warmer coil. Uh, these temperature adjustments take several minutes to happen in the furnace, and there's a lot of very expensive steel in the furnace at one time. So uh, warmer coils are expensive. Even more expensive are these prime coils. These uh, HS, or excuse me, these, these trip and twip steels have a lot of alloying elements. They're very expensive product. So we don't want to secondary any of those if we can, because it's a significant economic hit to the company uh, if we have to do that. Uh, the other thing we have to avoid is line breaks. Uh, if you have a line break in an annealing furnace, you have to shut that entire furnace down. It has to be cooled from you know eight to 24 hours. So the doors can be opened and the, the workers can get in there and actually rethread that furnace. So uh, we also, we have to avoid that. And uh, you can't stop this line because uh, the, the steel has to be moving continuously through the zinc pot or you'll get a bad uh, bad spot in the steel. And obviously the, the furnace is hot. So even if you shut the heat off to the furnace, if you stop that material in the furnace, it's going to be over annealed and all that material in the furnace, again, which could be you know half a coil, is going to be scrapped. So I've uh, talked for quite a while now just to really come to the point of the problem statement that, that we're trying to solve with the SI's continuous annealing equipment is that there is a huge need for not only new product development of continuously annealed steels, but there's also a huge need for process optimization, the process window definition, and there's also a need for the ability to upgrade secondary or excess material and apply those to either prime orders or high value secondary orders. Uh, the second part of this problem statement is that continuous annealing simulations are very hard to do. You can't do them in a box furnace. Box furnace is not fast enough. Uh, induction is difficult to maintain consistency. Uh, as a result, right now, most continuous annealing trials are done on the line itself. So this is obviously a very expensive proposition. Uh, if I'm doing industrial line trials, I have to use an entire coil of steel per trial. That means I get one data point from a coil of steel, a coil of steel that may cost you know $1,000 a ton easily after the, the zinc uh, and continuous annealing costs are applied. So that's uh, you know that's that's a 20 ton coil. That might be twenty thousand dollars for one data point. Now, if I can offload that from the continuous annealing line itself and do those annealing trials in the lab, I can save an immense amount of money. Uh, now there are other ways to do this. A lot of steel companies have pilot lines, so they built essentially a, a mini annealing line that takes uh, four inch coils four inch wide coils and runs them through the line. That's a very good process, but it's uh, again, prohibitively expensive. Those lines are incredibly expensive. Uh, the coils are incredibly expensive to run the, the samples. And uh, it's just a, a very, it requires a lot of space, requires a lot of time to do. So uh, other dedicated annealing systems are available, but they're, they're all very expensive. So what we want to do in, DSI is, is provide a, a more cost-effective way of doing this, cost-effective both in terms of the initial equipment required and also cost-effective in, in terms of the samples required, the footprint required, and the manpower required to run it. One of the other things I'd like to talk about here for a moment is that uh, the annealing response is a function of both time at temperature. So while I mentioned before, it's very difficult to change the temperature in a continuous annealing furnace, the operators do have the ability to change the line speed, which affects the time that the steel remains in the furnace. So there are a lot of variables here. The point is that there's a, there are, are several levers that the line operator you know, has to work with to control the annealing response of the material that's running through the furnace. So there are opportunities when you're producing schedules to run a coil of steel at a higher temperature than you would maybe normally run it at, but increase the line speed so it spends less time in the furnace, 
or conversely, if I have, uh, I'm transitioning from a product that has a lower annealing temperature and I am trying to heat up my furnace, I can offset that temperature difference with line speed changes and maybe do a slower line speed as I run through the furnace to compensate for the lower temperature that I, uh, that I have in my furnace as I'm transitioning from product to product. But what this means for the metallurgical researcher is now I have to not only understand the effects of a different temperature on any given alloy, I have to affect, understand the effects of different temperatures at different times on that alloy. And if I have the ability to create an entire process window for a given product, I can give that information to the line scheduler and he or she can make schedules that will allow us to run prime coil to prime coil to prime coil, avoid warmer coils and avoid transitions and still meet the customer's demands for the, uh, the specifications of, of each coil that comes off that line. The other thing that you have to remember is that, you know, when business is good, obviously you want to run the line at the fastest speed possible because you're trying to maximize your production. But remember that the line cannot stop without scrapping all the material in the furnace. So if your orders are slow, if perhaps they had a problem upstream in the melt shop or in the, in the rolling mill and they had to remake an order, you may have a gap in your schedule at the continuous annealing line. So it's often desirable to run that material as slow as possible so you can keep the production line going. Again, from the metallurgical researcher standpoint, this means that I have to understand the entire process window of any given alloy, not just one recipe to make that alloy. I have to have a whole list of recipes to make that alloy, or excuse me, to, to anneal that alloy uh, in order to most efficiently efficiently schedule the line. So it is critical when you're trying to do efficient schedules to make sure that the operators understand the time temperature interrelations for each different product that they're running. Uh, this is usually not done. I find that almost never in a continuous annealing line can the line operators give me the entire process window of temperatures versus times that will uh, allow them to produce a, a sellable product off that line. This is usually because those trials are so expensive to do that they just don't get done. So if we can offer via, via simulation a cheaper way to do that trial, those trials, then we can certainly run a much more efficient schedule and save literally millions and millions of dollars uh, every month on a continuous annealing line. So there's a very high payoff for having the ability to do physical simulation of continuous strip annealing in your laboratory. Uh, you can determine the optimized parameters for new alloys. Uh, you can optimize the transitions and the schedule to produce more efficient schedules and reduce warmer coils and secondary coils. Uh, you can increase productivity by truly understanding what the maximum line speed that you can run at is. You can minimize line stops by determining the minimum line speeds. And another point that could be very important is that you can salvage uh, either excess or orphan coils or off chemistry heats. So remember when we were talking about the initial steel making process that uh, you know you have to really you have to really alloy five or six coils worth of material at any given time. And if I have an order for only two coils, that means I have four coils excess that I have to figure out how to process. Uh, I may not have orders that really actually call for that precise alloy chemistry, but if through physical simulation, I can figure out a way to anneal that alloy and apply that material to prime orders, that allows me to not melt another heat for those prime orders, and it allows me a, a valuable money-making outlet for those excess coils. Uh, the other point that this could make money is I can also maybe reduce transitions in my melt shop. So if I can figure out the processing to run 10, 12, 20 different, uh, you know, different customer specs out of the same chemistry in my melt shop, then I can probably reduce transitions there in my melt shop and limit uh, excess coils there. Now it may not be the cheapest alloy for a given uh, a given application. But if I can apply different chemistries to different orders, that gives me the flexibility to utilize 100% of my production capacity. And that can be very important and, then, and may in the end be the difference between profit and loss at any given steel company. So I've talked about some of this already. So consolidating grades. Uh, the other thing you can do if you really have good 
uh, continuous annealing simulation capabilities, just explore alloy savings. Do you really need the alloy to make properties on every one of your grades, or you can possibly trade processing for alloy additions? And obviously that just saves money on alloys. And if I can trade thermal processing for alloy, it's almost always gonna be a cost-effective solution. So having uh, gone through a fairly extensive kind of background here of, of, of why this is important and, and how it can be used uh, in a steel company to, to save money and, you know, by extension, how it can be useful for a university or a researcher to have this capability to allow your customers in the steel industry to save money. Uh, I'm going to just segue a little bit into the different options that uh, Glebel currently offers for strip annealing. So right now we have three different options uh, that you that we can provide for strip annealing simulation. Our standard two inch wide system actually is designed to fit within the vacuum tank uh, of a normal Glebel system, either a 3500 or a 3800 Glebel system. Uh, it goes right into the vacuum tank. You do have to have a, a Glebel in order for this to work because it is a, an option or an accessory for a standard Glebel. And it has the ability to do a specimen from which an ASTM E8 or uh, a JIS or a, a DIN tensile specimen can be taken. Uh, we had several years ago some call from people that wanted to do limiting dome height, uh, limited drying ratios, different formability tests on material. So we did create a five inch wide strip annealing MCU, the, again, that goes on a standard Glebel system. This is though in, uh, in, in difference from the standard two inch system, this is a, an MCU itself. So you have to roll off the, the existing MCU, put the five inch strip annealing MCU on and do those tests. But it will give you similar performance, uh, slightly wider uh, uh, thermal gradient because of the larger sample, but similar performance and, and it can be used for a sample that can give you some, some very useful on, uh, you know, further on formability testing. Uh, we've also recently introduced a new 525 dedicated strip annealing simulator. This is a single purpose machine designed only for strip annealing simulation. Uh, it is essentially, for those of you who have, have are familiar with our new 500 series Glebel, it is essentially a 500 series Glebel with the two inch strip annealing system uh, permanently attached. It's got a different tank than the 500 series. It's got the, the uh, strip annealing jaws permanently put in, but what this allows us to do is significantly reduce the budget to bring this capability into your laboratory. Both the two inch and the five inch strip annealing options require you know, a full Glebel in order to operate. The, the 525 strip annealing only simulator is a small machine. It doesn't need hydraulics. It doesn't do, you know, it doesn't pull anything other than, than the line tension on the sample. So it's, uh, it allows us to, to really cut out some of the controls and some of the requirements of that machine and, and offer it at a, at a much lower price point, significantly reducing the budget necessary. So I've pretty much described everything here already on the two inch small strip annealing system. So let's just uh, move over to a, a sample. So this is a standard sample for our two inch strip annealing system. This is a 50 millimeter wide sample. And again, you see the three thermocouples on this sample. Those are the thermocouples that we use to verify that the entire test zone of an ASTM, JIS or DIN sheet sample is within the, the proper temperature regime. Uh, this sample goes in a vacuum tank. This is just a schematic of the two inch strip annealing system that would go in the vacuum tank of a standard Glebel showing in red the sample. The jaws on the left and right, they're used to conduct the current into the sample to heat the sample. And the, uh, we call it the shower head or the, the quench head. So this is a gas quench head that is uh, shown below the sample, and this is used then to, to quench the sample. Here is a picture of the sample in the Glebel vacuum tanks. So you can see the sample, you can see the quench head below the sample with the heat shields on both sides. You can see that the sample is not clamped in here. The sample is just setting in here. So there are clamps that, that go on both ends of the sample to hold it. Uh, this is a close up of the clamp on the left side just showing how the, the clamping works. It's just a, a simple screw clamp uh, that, is, that is put in. 
And then this is the, the sample showing uh, hot. Obviously, we do have a little bit of thermal gradient left to right, just like all Glebal samples. We have uh, cool jaws, so the ends of the sample are going to be cool while the center is heated with resistance heating. But <clears throat> you can see that the, the test zone of a tensile sample that will later be cut from this bar is fairly uniform in temperature. And of course, that can be verified by the thermocouples that you see attached to the, the sheet surface here. These are the current specifications that we have published of our of our two inch or 50 millimeter strip annealing uh, setup that goes in a standard Glebal. So we have uh, uh, temperature uniformity, uniform zone sizes. Uh, we offer this uh, down to 0.5 millimeter thickness and up to two millimeter thickness. Obviously, you can do thinner or thicker sheets if you uh, desire, but we don't really uh, necessarily guarantee these specifications as if you go thinner or thicker. Uh, I would like to point out here, you see in orange that this is the, the maximum cooling rate using nitrogen gas. So we do have recently done some work on high flow helium and we can get much, much better cooling rates. And I'll, I'll go into that uh, here in a little bit. That is still an ongoing project, but uh, I think at this point we'd be comfortable saying that with high flow helium we can significantly increase these cooling rates as well for, for those of you that are interested in advanced high strength steels that require better cooling rates. This is just an example of a continuous annealing cycle in the two inch strip annealing setup that shows the thermal gradient across three different thermocouples and you see that the the uh, the thermal gradient in all three, or excuse me, the, the temperature of all three uh, points that are measured match very close to the uh, the target temperature, and we're able to do very complex cycles. This one shows, you know, a single heating rate, a hold, two different cooling rates, and then a, just a free air cool at the end as we're, you know, below about, about 300 C, where we're not really concerned of any more metallurgical changes happening in the sample. Uh, just breaking this down a little bit, uh, this shows uh, close-ups of the previous graph showing that we hit, you know, very close to our, our 10C heating rate, very good thermal gradient on the heat up, very good thermal gradient on the cool down at a rate of 63.54C per second. Uh, we do get a little variation in the free cooling portion here, but again, there were well below 300C, so frankly, we made no attempt to control that because we were below the temperature at where any further metallurgical uh, changes would be occurring. This is a different process simulation uh, showing basically the same the same data, the, the program temperature and the three thermocouple temperatures. Uh, none of these actually that I have in this in this uh, presentation show reheating, but we could cool and then reheat if we wanted to. We could do uh, multiple cycles. We can essentially you know do anything you'd like, even if the, the line wouldn't be able to do that. You know maybe researchers want to determine how to build the next line. So it's a very flexible system, and we can really control you know whatever we want as far as the uh, thermal profile of these uh, annealing cycles. One of the things that we've added in the recent years is the, the feedback controlled or proportional quench. The original Glebal strip annealing quench was a, a pulsed water uh, mist system. Uh, it, was, it was quite good, but it did have some issues with setup in order to get a good mist coverage of the sample and get a good thermal gradient on cooling. And obviously, anytime you use cooling in uh, cooling water in a Glebal, it means that you have to clean up the tank before the next run in order to get a good vacuum. So we've developed a new feedback controlled proportional gas quench system that we now use uh, almost exclusively in the Glebal. It is, uh, gives us a more accurate rate control. It actually gives a little bit better cooling rates than we were able to get with the water mist cooling. Uh, the thermal gradients are better and obviously the cleanup time is, is much less without water. Uh, since you're not having to try to adjust nozzles, it's a faster and easier setup and a simplified program. This graph just shows the uh, proportional quench. Uh, so we have added the feedback control to our quench system. So this just shows both the, the program temperature and the, the feedback signal for the proportional quench valve. And you see that when we first start cooling here, we have a, a feedback signal that indicates the valve is not open all the way because again, we have very good cooling rates. It's obviously easier to cool at high temperatures where we have a higher delta T. And then as we get closer to uh, room temperature, we require more and more gas because the delta T uh, of the, the sample to the gas 
temperature changes and we require more and more gas and and again we're able to to keep this cooling rate down to you know about about you know 200 250 C which is is well below where we frankly really care because below 250 C we're not really getting any appreciable annealing response in the material anymore. This is just a close up of the new quench head that we talked about. And this is our high flow helium that, that I discussed earlier. So this is actually a 300 degree C per second cooling rate using high flow helium quench. So uh, by changing the valve, the excuse me, the pressure regulator that we use, we're able to get a much higher flow than traditionally we had on this system. And by using helium, we can get a much greater cooling rate. So in this case, we're getting a 300 C per second cooling rate, and we're able actually to match that cooling rate very, very well. In the initial experiments, we got 400 degrees C per second cooling rates that we could maintain down to about 350 C. And they did drop off at 350 C, but uh, we we're again able to maintain 250 C, or excuse me, 300 C per second cooling rates down to uh, about 300 C per second. So uh, this is something that we will be commercializing uh, very soon and uh, we will be upgrading those specs that I showed you earlier to reflect uh, the high flow helium cooling capabilities that are that are available. I just have a few more slides left to go over a couple more of our, our options. I mentioned earlier the large sample strip annealing MCU. This is essentially a similar setup to the two inch strip annealing MCU. Uh, it uses the same proportional quench, except that we can now, by by offering this in a in an MCU package, we can have a a five inch wide sample with a uniform temperature zone. And again, this was developed because we had customers that wanted to do uh, larger samples for post formability testing. Uh, very similar to this one, instead of using a simple screw clamp, it uses pneumatic clamps to make sure we have good contact with both ends of the sample to make sure that we have enough uh, contact to get the current necessary to heat that large sample. Uh, here you see again the quench flow head. So there is no sample in this system. Left and right you see the, the pneumatically controlled jaws. You see the quench plate behind it and the sample would, uh, would, would span between these two jaws. This is a view with the sample. I uh, apologize, this is not a very high quality photograph, but this shows how the sample goes in between the two jaws. This just shows one thermocouple. Obviously, typically we would instrument this with several thermocouples to ensure that that thermal gradient was, uh, was sufficient. So these are the specs for the large sample strip annealing unit. You can see here we can go to a little thicker samples and you do see a little less temperature uniformity. Obviously, it's harder to get a, a minimal thermal gradient in something that's uh, that's five inches wide than something that's two inches wide. So we do sacrifice a little bit of thermal gradient control, but we gain the ability to do the much larger sample. Just a few slides here introducing the Global 525 dedicated strip annealing simulator that I talked about. So this is essentially a, a 500 series platform with a dedicated strip annealing system grafted onto it. So this has a horizontal tank. It's a little unlike the other Glebals, uh, kind of maybe back to what some of you might remember from a Glebal 1500. And the strip goes in the tank, and uh, this will have essentially the same specs. I'm not gonna list the specs here, but it will have essentially the same specs as the two inch strip annealing system that goes into the Glebal 35 or 3800. So the benefit of this system is that it is a thermal only machine there are no hydraulics needed you don't need the hydraulic pump it does have a air ram to keep strip tension uh, on the strip to simulate tension that a strip would see in the in the continuous furnace uh, and it's a, a very small footprint so it can go right in the lab it's going to be a reduced price so it can be affordable on the line level uh, really our our market analysis that we designed this machine off was based on the need for a machine at the line level. Uh, right now, almost all strip annealing simulation exists at the corporate research level only, where either a pilot line or a full global system can be justified. 
but there are often cases that uh, a line metallurgist has a coil that was either misprocessed or is excess that's sitting in front of the line. It's cold rolled full hard, it's not oiled, so he, there's a minimal amount of time that that coil has to be processed before it rusts. So what we want to do here is offer this machine at a price point, uh, simplicity of use point, uh, and footprint uh, envelope that can be placed directly on the annealing line to give the line metallurgist or the technical manager of that annealing line the ability to do these simulations right at the line, not have to cut samples, send samples to a corporate research lab, you know, shipping, wait for the corporate lab to have time to, to do the samples, ship them back. Uh, by that time, oftentimes it's probably too late to do something with a coil. So uh, we will have marketing information available for this uh, and uh, we're happy to, to answer any questions. Our DSI sales staff will be happy to talk to you about uh, about the new 525 or the 2-inch strip annealing system or the 5-inch strip annealing system. Great. Thank you, Brian. I'm going Thank to you very much. Uh, share my screen here for a moment. And I want to just put some information up so that, that people can see some contact information while we review a, a few questions. Uh, so there were, again, a lot of people on the call today, a lot of questions did come in, and a lot of our, our, our team was answering them kind of on the fly. A couple of things did come up that I thought we could review. Uh, one of the questions was, uh, what type of skill level is required to operate the 525? I mean, I think the 500 series in general is uh, has a target of um, you know, universities or uh, kind of down at the a production level do you need to be a phd metallurgist to run this or is this uh i believe this is more uh, designed for a little more, more production focused could you comment on that uh absolutely so so what we've tried to do with the 525 is 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 essentially our goal is to bridge both worlds so we've we've tried to keep the uh, the capability there to do you know very very advanced work but also make it simple enough that it can be used by you know the the undergraduate student or the 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 technician at the annealing line as as i mentioned earlier you know one of the things we tried to do with this machine was was bring it to market uh and have it able to be used at the individual annealing line level so you know there there may or may not be a metallurgist uh, assigned to annealing line but but essentially we want this to be useful for a you know a laboratory technician now it will require a little bit of training it is a you know it is a high-tech piece of equipment but you know our goal is to to make this uh, useful and usable by a laboratory technician who you know i think anyone that's 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 able to use you know modern high-tech uh you know computer controlled tensile test equipment anyone that can program you know a, a furnace uh, should be able to use this uh, as you saw from the uh, from the schematic it's got a, a very advanced touchscreen interface so that the HMI the human machine interface has been redesigned uh, and it's uh, similar to our, our our bigger machine HMIs but obviously it's got uh, you know fewer fewer capabilities so so fewer buttons so uh, I, I would say you can't just put an untrained person on it but uh, I think someone with, with a minimal amount of training that is familiar and comfortable with, you know, programmed tensile test and other laboratory equipment should be able to run this with no problem. Great. Thank you. Uh, one of the questions that came in uh, was actually answered uh, by Brian Spahosky, one of our, our service engineers. But I'll, I'll ask the question and let me just read his response. Uh, the question was about uh, what is the cooling rate of free cooling? Uh, and this is a, a good question. Uh, Brian responded that the free cooling rate at high temperatures is faster than it is at low temperatures. So it's a nonlinear curve as the sample is cooling down. Uh, and then Brian uh, said that we have incorporated our proportional quenching unit to stop annealing, uh, to strip annealing option to give us maximum flexibility during a quenching or cool down process. Uh, this proportional quenching valve can automatically adjust air or gas flow during the quench process. Uh, and Brian, you, you did mention a few times that you know, a lot of times Times the ends of the tests, we're kind of letting it just free cool, uh, mostly because it's at, you know we're not too concerned about what's happening at, at the, those lower temperatures. Yeah, and I, I would say we would not very often just want to free cool the sample down to you know from from temperature and free cool all the way down. Although we certainly could do that, uh, but again, I really can't really answer. I don't know 
what the answer to that would be, uh, primarily because it depends significantly on thickness. Obviously, a, a you know a two inch millimeter or two millimeter, excuse me, thick strip is going to cool much slower than a you know than a 0.5 millimeter thick strip. So, uh, but we can control that cooling rate entirely by either you know if the if the desired cooling rate is slower than the natural cooling rate, we can we can continue to heat the sample while it's cooling. And uh, as Brian mentioned, we have you know we have full cooling capability, so we can we can get whatever cooling rate you know is necessary. So great. Okay, thank you. And then a uh, question about uh, tension during strip annealing, uh, you know, either in the in the Gleeble, obviously during the the simulations, but also in the you know in, in production as well. Uh, but is there a difference uh, when you know in, in our systems with the uh, having tension on, on the strip annealing specimen or without tension? Yeah, we can apply tension to this. Uh, it's it's uh, it's a pneumatic tension system, so similar to the big Glebel. For those of you who are familiar with it, you know there's an air ram in the system. Uh, so we do pull tension on the strip. We do that for two reasons. One, because there's uh, you know the need to keep the strip from buckling as it expands thermally. If we didn't have a way to 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 keep tension on the strip, you know we'd get a bow in the strip as it expands as it's heated. But there's also tension in the in the line. So obviously, as you run a line, you have to keep tension on the strip to pull the strip through the line, and uh, we can simulate that uh, that in the 525. Now the lines, typically that I'm familiar with, they try to run uh, as much tension as they can because that helps eliminate things like furnace buckles and some other defects that you can get. But as I discussed before, you don't want to pull too much tension because if you get a line break in the furnace, that's uh, you know you're down for for a shift or probably a day at least. So typically, line operators will try to run some tension, but they're fairly conservative with how much tension they put on the strip. And you know, with this air ram, we can we can apply uh, a fair amount of tension and certainly match the tension that you would see in a continuous annealing line. Okay, great. Uh... We had a question about uh, someone has uh, very uh, specific temperature requirements. I want to keep it uh, very accurate. Is how accurate can we be? Can we be within one degree C uh, in in the Gleeble? Uh, and I know there's different me uh, you know, measurements across the the specimen. Uh, and you may not be able to answer this on the fly here in terms of you know how accurate can we heat? Uh, obviously the the charts, the set point versus the temperature that we're measuring on TC. You know they look like they're overlapping. Uh, but obviously there's going to be some difference there. Uh, can you comment on okay, how close we can hit to that, that set point? Yeah, I mean, I think on heating, and and again, there's there's a lot of, of variables there. You know, it depends on what the heating rate is, the cooling rate is. Uh, if the if the heating and cooling rates are are well within the the capability of the system, you know, I think we I think we publish our our heating control accuracy is is plus or minus one C, which means that the the system yeah. will control the temperature to the 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 thermocouple to to about plus or minus one c now as you go to to higher and higher heating rates that that are, are approaching the the capability of the machine obviously that will start to deviate a little bit uh really where you, most of the time you have to be a little more careful is is if you're trying to heat at a fast heating rate to a temperature and then immediately hold at that temperature so you you might have a little overshoot there and there are ways to get around that by you know by programming a, a slightly reduced heating rate just before you get to your hold temperature. Uh, but most of the deviations there would be around transitions, but uh, but yeah, at, at a at a steady state or at a at a reasonable heating or cooling rate, you know, we, we should be pretty close to that uh, plus or minus one C control accuracy. Now, the other thing I'll have to talk about is, is as you can see in the specs, there is a specification on thermal gradient. So obviously we're heating the sample with direct resistance the the edges of the sample have a you know they have that extra edge to radiate heat so the edges of the sample will be a little cooler than the center of the sample we are clamping the sample in in cooled jaws grips at both ends so those those ends are going to be a little cooler so there is a, a thermal gradient in the sample and you know depending on how close you need that uh, you know you can get fairly close and one of the things that you can do if that is more important to you is uh, you can insulate the sample to limit the heat that's being lost that reduces that thermal gradient it also reduces the achievable cooling rate though so there are trade-offs there uh, 
but and the other thing you can do if, if you want a really, really close thermal grading over an entire tensile sample is, is go to a, a subsize type tensile sample. The specs we have are for a full size sample, but obviously if you go to a, a subsize tensile sample, you have a smaller area, so your thermal grading is going to be much better and much closer to what you're looking for. Great. Thanks, Brian. Uh, we are just about out of time here. I did ha I do have up on the screen a few different uh, contact information. Uh, I think the I mentioned in a previous webinar uh, for service requests, you can always email service at weeble.com. Uh, that will go uh, to our team and get distributed to uh, you know, whoever is obviously not, not, not traveling. We, we want to get back to you as best as we can. A lot of our guys do need to travel. So if they're on a, a flight for 18 hours, uh, they can't get right back to you. So uh, emailing service at Weeble.com is the best bet. You also can use the customer service portal. I, I talked about this a couple of weeks ago, I believe. Uh, go to uh, our Weeble.com and then the resources tab, and then there's customer service portal. Uh, users can uh, sign up, create an account. I will get back to you within about a day or a day or two. Uh, do you, so it's for users only. At this point, we'll confirm that you are a user, and then you can create tickets and search a knowledge base. It's really convenient. Uh, for parts, consumables, and upgrades, uh, please email parts at Google.com. That will go to uh, directly to David Jacon and Susan Castagne, who many of our users will know and love. Uh, application solutions and sales support, you can always email uh, me or any of our, you know, our presenters that have presented in the past, uh, but info at Google.com. That will go to a handful of us, and we'll make sure we, we get that out to uh, the, the right uh, resource in your region. And also, I put here research at Google.com. Uh, you know, we'd love to hear what you're working on. Uh, this isn't a, a call for papers for a specific conference. Uh, we just like to see what people are working on, see how they're, uh, how things are going and, and the, the, the work that they're doing. So if you're publishing a paper, please feel free to send them to us. Uh, we'd love to read them. Uh, it also is useful uh, so we can just know what people are working on. Uh, it helps maybe with collaborations or, or, or networking. So uh, please do send that out to, uh, to, us, to us if you get a chance. Uh, if you have any questions, let us know. Uh, we're here to support you. I want to thank everyone for joining us again, uh, and please uh, stay safe and healthy. Have a great day.